Uh, we'll get started. Okay, so a few things. Uh, first thing is I posted assignment two, uh, so you can take a look at it. It will be due in two weeks plus a slip day if you didn't use your slip day for assignment one. Uh, in assignment two, you'll do a cognitive walkthrough. So we talked a bit about this last class and I'm gonna do one as well so you can sort of see what it looks like. Um, and so you can choose uh, one of these two things. Uh, one's called Ghostry and one's called uh, Privacy Badger. Uh, both of them are extensions to a browser. So you can do it on your own computer. You need a browser like Chrome, Firefox. Uh, they might work with Safari or IE, I, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, and then what you'll do is you'll come up with your own core tasks. So when we looked at Tor, uh, and we'll, we will continue to look at Tor this class, uh, the core tasks that we had were just, you know, basically install it, configure it, uh, and then confirm that it's working and be able to turn it off, okay? So you can think about how well those four things map onto this uh, assignment too, but you can also think of other things that you might wanna do, okay? So I'd like you to come up with seven uh, tasks that someone might wanna do uh, with this software and then you're going to uh, do the actual walkthrough itself. Uh, you're not going to do the walkthrough for all seven of your tasks, so choose the three that you think are sort of the most important or the most substantial, uh, and then you can, do, uh, you can do your walkthrough of those three, okay? Uh, the walkthrough guidelines, uh, you can use the ones that we have from class. Uh, if you want to modify them, that's fine. Okay, so you can say, just tell me that you're making a modification, what it is and, and why you wanna modify it. Uh, maybe there's something here that's not quite captured in what you wanna do, so it's fine, but you can also just proceed. There's no marks associated with the guidelines themselves, so you can uh, just use these eight guidelines uh, yourself. Okay, and uh, you, uh, there's, there's a limit of one page per core task. So for three core tasks, it's basically three pages. Uh, if you wanna have screenshots and that type of thing, you'll see sort of when I do it uh, in class that sometimes you, you might do a screenshot or something like that. Uh, that's fine, you can, you can add that stuff, okay? Now, part of the assignment too is uh, you also need to be a dual expert. So dual means you're an expert in doing a cognitive walkthrough. Obviously, it's your first time doing it. You're not an expert per se, uh, but you should know enough about it to be able to do it. Okay, and then the second thing is you wanna understand what it is that you're studying as well, okay? So there's no marks associated with it, but it will kind of come through in your evaluation that you understand what these tools are doing and how they're working, okay? So at a very high level, what they do is they uh, allow you to start tracking cookies. Uh, so if you're on a website, uh, there's uh, third-party trackers uh, that can track your behavior on that website. Now, this assignment's nice because it's going to fit into the last piece of the course. Uh, so later today, we'll talk about policies and procedures. I'll give a simple example that has nothing to do with technology, and then we're going to look at something called the same origin policy, uh, which is a policy that browsers implement. And so this, this whole third-party tracking thing is, is sort of uh, part of um, the same origin policy, or at least the browser's cookie policy, which is, is very similar to the same origin policy. Okay, um, so, so anyway, so there's a sort of pattern to all of this, but you can learn about these tools, uh, read a bit about them. Uh, you don't have to write anything about how they work, but uh, when you go through them and you decide, okay, are users going to make the right decision or the wrong decision, then you need to know what the right decision is, right? And in order to know that, you need to know how they work a bit as well, okay? so. Um, Anyway, so this is meant to be kind of more realistic where like you go into work and they just sort of say, go, go tell me the usability of this thing. Okay, so you can, at strict, at strict level, you just have to do a cognitive walkthrough of those core tasks. But a lot of the assignment isn't, like the, the actual walkthrough itself shouldn't take you much time. Okay, the hard part of the assignment is what are the core tasks? Well, I don't know what the core task is until I know what the tool's doing, right? And how does the tool work? And you know what are the three most important core tasks that I'm going to do my usability study on that type of thing. Okay, so a lot of it's just sort of thinking, absorbing what you're being asked to study, thinking a bit about it, and then sort of choosing the path through it. And then once you make all those decisions, the actual process of doing the cognitive walkthrough shouldn't 
it shouldn't be that burdensome. Uh, you should, you know, it might take you an hour, you know, to do all three or, or something like that. Okay. Uh, so anyway, so think about this. Is there any questions immediately? Yeah. Yeah, so I want seven, so you can use my four plus the other ones. I'll tell you that one and two are probably not relevant. Um, like, you, you might combine one and two, yeah? And three is specific about anonymity, right? Uh, and so that's not also not relevant to this because it's not an anonymity tool, but you can do something along that line, like confirm that the tool's working or, or whatever if you think that that's a kind of a core task. And then CT4 makes sense as well. Okay, other questions that jump out? Okay, good. So, uh, you know, try and look at it this week uh, or, or do the whole assignment if you want. Uh, but if you have more questions uh, next week, then you can ask them and then it will be due the, the following week. Okay. Um, okay, so what is a kind of, yep, yeah, go ahead. Okay, okay, sure. So let's, uh, I, I forgot about that, but uh, let's take a few, let's sort of do a recap of, of those and then we'll, we'll jump back to the, uh, to the cognitive walkthrough itself. Okay. So in terms of testing, I don't, I'm not going to test you heavily on the content of it because you can't ask questions of the speaker and things like that. Um, it's more like I just want to get you to get the high level idea of basically what ethics is, why it's important. It's also something that relates to security, but it, it's not technical, so it tends to fall through the cracks. Like maybe in 6120 or something like that, you, ethics may come up. But it, it actually should be taught in all of the core courses uh, that you take, okay? So um, the main draw point from the first video, the, the moral character of cryptography, um, so all the crypto details and things like that don't really matter, okay? Uh, but it just it's good because he gives a lot of concrete uh, ideas, okay? Um, but the, the main idea actually of both of the videos is that ethics should be considered in every project, okay? And in particular, you might be, I think in the first talk he gives an example of someone that came in and they gave a job talk and it was on like, I don't know, differential privacy or some big data or something like that, right? And so he asked them, well, what about the ethical considerations? And they're sort of like, well, there are none, right? It's just math, I'm just doing algorithms. I want my algorithm to be faster than the fastest algorithm in the literature and then that's it, right? And then his point is, well, where's that algorithm going to be used, right? It's, it's really only suitable for big data. I mean, it's, it's for big data. So who has big data? Well, big data is like Facebook and Twitter and, you know, things like that. Or, or maybe like the NSA or like spy agencies and things like that, right? And then you're basically making their job easier. You're making it easier to find patterns in data, right? And so is there really no moral consideration there? Is there no ethical consideration? Or is that research in an indirect way affirming the collection of data and big data, right? Now, he's not saying you shouldn't do it, right? That's not at all the point, right? And it's not saying that Facebook is evil or anything like that. It's just that you need to think through the consequences of what you're doing, okay? So when you do your final projects, for example, there is some ethical, I don't care what you pick, right? There's going to be some ethical consideration for it, right? And so you should think about that. You should think about uh, what the ethics are uh, for whatever the topic is uh, that you're exploring, okay? And then uh, in the second one, I, I can't remember the exact details, but anyways, it, it came up, it was like sort of a network study and things like that. It also like had that flavor at the onset, you don't think that there's any ethical issues, right? You're just going out and you're collecting data. But then when you think about what the data is and, and the consequences of it, then you realize that there's issues, okay? So the main, the main point is that ethics should be considered in every project. And 
even projects that do not seem that don't seem to have an ethical dimension often do. So let's just think about the things that we've talked about in class. Okay, so so far we've talked about, let's say, social engineering. Is there an ethical dilemma, dimension to social engineering? Is, is ethics relevant to social engineering? Yes, yeah, why? Okay. First off, we, we talked a lot of, about a lot of practices that you could go out and you could be an adversary to other people using techniques, right? Um, so the, the techniques. And we teach them to you so you know how to defend from them, right? Um, but it's just like, a, like say we did a network, say this was network security and I showed you how to end map a network or whatever, how to pen, penetrate like some network right? You could turn around and go do that, right? Or if I showed you, here's a cross-site scripting vulnerability. I remember another person, uh, like a famous kind of professor, he said he gave a computer network, uh, like kind of a web security class. And he showed, uh, he wanted to show a live example of a cross-site scripting uh, vulnerability. So he found a movie theater that was nearby and there was a cross-site scripting vulnerability. So you could actually purchase a ticket without, without paying for it, right? And then uh, a couple years later, he was at convocation. Some students were like talking to him and they're like, oh yeah, like it was so cool that you showed it to us. I like, we saw so many free movies, you know, in the last couple of years because you showed us that vulnerability, right? And he's like, oh, that, you know, that wasn't the purpose of it, right? So that, that's sort of the, the ethical uh, dimension. So, so uh, the techniques can, can be used for bad purposes. Uh, if you're doing it as a job, you could, like we talked about, like you could get someone fired, right? Uh, like just by testing whether you can get past them or things like that. So there's, uh, and there's certain techniques that, that maybe you wouldn't use, right? Like are you going to use coercion or the threat of violence or anger, right? Like are those things that you would do if you were hired by a firm in order to do it? And you might say, no, that, that crosses an ethical, an ethical line, right? Um, so there's, uh, there's certain things that are illegal, like impersonating a police officer, that type of thing. Um, you could get someone fired. Okay, so the, they're all considerations, okay? Uh, usability, is there ethical considerations? Let's say you wanna do some sort of user study. So we said you have to clear ethics, right? It was one of the very first things. It's the very first step is go to ethics, right? So that ethics board exists because it is thought that there are ethical implications to doing studies, okay? Most of them, a lot of them are because you're using human participants and obviously if you're doing some sort of medical trial, like you have some drug and you're not sure whether it works or not, you don't wanna just go give it to a bunch of people and get them sick because it doesn't work, right? And so that's sort of where that idea came, but then it slowly got expanded from just medical to psychology, right? Like say you're going in and you're doing a deception study or you're inciting violence or things like that. Um, and then if you're doing it for psychology, well, even if I'm bringing you into the lab to test out software, that's kind of psychology, right? So it's not obviously, um, immune from that, okay? Um, so there's a lot of ethics around uh, deception's the main one. So you, you bring someone in, uh, the study is about X, like passwords, but you don't wanna say it's about passwords because then they're thinking about passwords and they're thinking about security, right? So you, you tell them it's about something else, 
you get them to do something with passwords, and that's really the, what the, the, the study is as well, okay? Uh, so data collection is another one, so that's sort of uh, part of the, the second video. Um, so actually today we'll talk about Tor. Uh, so one of the first uh, things that I remember when I was a grad student is there were some other grad students and they uh, decided to uh, just measure all, you'll see how Tor works in a second, but they decided to just put up a server and record all the traffic uh, that's coming out of Tor and try and categorize it as like, is it illegal behavior or legal behavior? Or like what, what are people using Tor for or whatever? And uh, then other people got really mad and they said, oh, you can't do that. And uh, especially like, what did you do with the data? Like that's private data. A lot of people that use Tor are like diplomats or, or uh, people like there could be political implications and it turned out the grad students they didn't really think about it so they just had it like on a USB stick that they were carrying around everywhere they didn't delete it or anything like that um, so that ended up being a big like kind of debate about oh do we accept the paper or do we reject it or uh, things like that okay um, so data collections one uh, uh, deception any study that involves deception um, there's things like like yeah if you're doing like some sort of network test like, are you, if I start sending packets from your computer, is that going to get you in trouble with your government? That type of thing. Uh, SSL TLS, are there ethical considerations with it? Okay. So any kind of privacy technology immediately has it. Right? So there's some people like law enforcement that maybe don't want to see HTTPS everywhere uh, because then their ability to monitor network traffic goes down, right? Or organizations as well, right? So you can think about the monitoring of network traffic. And then there's privacy enthusiasts who, who think that's a good thing, right? And so that's just an ethical debate, right? Are you on the privacy side or are you on the law enforcement side? Right. Um, it could be around exploits. So like people went to jail because when Heartbleed came out, right, lots of people wanted to just try it. Right. And I think the person, if I recall correctly, someone attacked the CRA, Canada Revenue Agency, with Heartbleed. They got a bunch of personal information. They ended up getting charged criminally with it. I forget what the outcome of the case was. Uh, but I think if I remember correctly, they weren't really like... They weren't, they didn't really know what they were doing, right? They just heard about this vulnerability and they found someone that had implemented it and they were just like kind of playing around, like poking around, seeing what was vulnerable. And then they did it. Uh, they didn't obfuscate their IP address or anything like that. And so then there was a log of them having done it. And then next thing you know, the, the police are there and it's, it's you know, a pretty serious uh, thing that happens, right? So this happens a lot too with uh, different exploits and things like that. Um, anyways, I, we don't have to keep going, but I'll, I'll just write, et cetera, et cetera. Passwords, whatever. Whatever we talked about, you can usually find some sort of ethical uh, consideration, or you can think about what's the technology being used for, okay? So anyways, the, the point of those lectures were to just try and get you to think uh, about the ethical dimensions uh, to, to the work that you do as well. Okay, any questions on, on it beyond that? Okay. All right, then let's uh, switch gears and we'll go back to the cognitive walkthrough. And so I'm going to do it for Tor. And before we do the walkthrough itself, I, I want to tell you a bit about what Tor is, how does it work, and uh, those kinds of things. So Tor is a tool that lets you browse the internet anonymously, okay? So it's a, a tool for anonymous web browsing.
Anonymous means that no one knows who you are. And you might think, well, the web's already anonymous, right? As long as I don't log into any websites. Like if I go to Google, Google doesn't know it's me, right? Um, so what, what does anonymity mean? And so what Tor does is it, it's only protecting one aspect of anonymity. So it's, it's not promising like anonymity in every sense of the word. It's designed just for one specific thing, uh, which is your IP address, okay? So every time you send a packet, you need to send an IP address. Otherwise, the response can't make its way back to your computer. Okay. So it's about hiding your IP address. And it doesn't really promise to do anything beyond that. Okay, we'll, we'll look at it and we'll see that it, it at least has considerations of other things. But uh, is it going to help you with cookies and tracking through cookies? Not necessarily. That's, that's not its job, right? Uh, is it going to, if you log into Gmail when you're on tour, does that mean that Google doesn't know that it's you that logged in? No, they know who you are because you just logged in, right? Or you submit your contact information on a form. You buy something online, you put your credit card name in and your, your name, then obviously the website knows who you are, okay? Um, so tour is really just about hiding your IP address. Uh, it can do some other things too, but, but we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll come to that later. Okay, now let's say you want to hide your IP address. Uh, what are, there's Tor, so that's one thing. Is there anything else that people use generally to hide their IP address? Nothing. Sorry? Nothing. Nothing? No, but nothing. Okay, okay. I don't know what that is, but it's okay. Nothing. Okay. Oh, natting. Sorry. Yeah. Or sorry. Yeah. I just didn't understand. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. So natting is. Uh, so this is network address translation. It doesn't really hide your IP address. It sort of. Um, uh, okay. Basically, what happens is, let's say you have a Wi-Fi network. You have 100 people on it. Do you need 100 IP addresses for your 100 people on your your network, right? And so, like, say you're at home and it's your home Wi-Fi. Do you have to go and get 100 IP addresses, one for each of your computers? That used to be the old school thing. So when I was growing up and you, you like, almost no one had more than one computer in their house, right? So if you had more than one, then you would uh, get, uh, you would have to buy, like, a couple IP addresses, right? And then you're paying a subscription for each of them. Um, so what you can do instead is you can sort of abuse the network protocol so that all your computers can hide behind one IP address, okay? Uh, but then what it does is it uses the port number, if I recall correctly, it's been a while. Uh, it uses the port number to actually distinguish your, your different computers. So uh, you send a packet inside your network, uh, your router rewrites the response as send it back to this IP address, the IP address of the router, and send it to port one, because that's computer one or send it to port two, because that's computer two. Then when the packet comes into port two, then it's like, okay, I know it's going to computer two, right? So I'll send it through its local network address. But then I also have to know what port it's supposed to go to, because I overwrote the port with uh, the number two, so I could keep track of which computer it is. So when it's outbound, your router is always writing down, oh, this is connecting to this server over this port number. And then when the packet comes back, they're like, okay, I know what port number. So I'm gonna put that over port 80 or port whatever, yeah. And then uh, sometimes it gets complicated if you're trying to like, uh, like say there's port blocking by your ISPs for like file sharing and things like that. Um, or you're trying to do encryption. Uh, and anyways, it's, yeah. So nodding something now that's like so standard that nobody thinks about it. It doesn't really hide your IP address because if I know, at least I can at least find your house, right? I might not know exactly which computer it is on your house, but I, I know who it is. And that's usually all you can trace it back to anyway. So let's say you did something illegal with your IP address. The law enforcement's going to go to your ISP and they're going to say, okay, who did you give this IP address to at this particular time? And they'll say, oh, it's to Jeremy Clark or whatever. And then, then they're going to come knock on my door, even if it was my kids or whatever, someone else that was on my network um, because I'm the account holder that, that it's coming to me. Yeah. Okay. So natting, that's fine. That's, that's one thing. Is there anything else that people think? 
Okay, so proxies, uh, VPNs, uh, that, that kind of thing. Yeah, so let's start with the proxy server and think about how they work. And then what Tor is, is it's, in a sense, it's kind of just a fancy proxy server. Okay, so the idea of a proxy is that it's going to sit between you and the server. So what the user is going to do is they're going to send a request, but instead of sending it directly to the server, they're going to send it to this proxy that's configured. It has to know that it's coming, okay? So it, it's configured to run this service. It's not like you can just send it to any random computer and use it as a proxy. So it's configured for this, purposes, for this purpose. Um, and uh, generally you'll have a client on your server, on your, sorry, on your computer that's going to package it up for you. Um, there's two ways of doing it. So one way is you can just use a straight proxy. In that case, you just need to get the IP address of the proxy and you can drop it into your browser settings, okay? Or what you could do is you could get an extension or something like that, put it in the extension so that you have a button so you can turn the proxy on and off. So that's actually how Tor worked when I was a grad student, is that you would, it was like a proxy, you would have to put in the IP address itself. Um, the other thing that that's that effectively is a proxy server, even though its purpose is not for proxying traffic, uh, is a VPN. So a VPN is a virtual private network, and it basically takes the traffic from your computer and makes it look like it's coming from somewhere else. And it's usually because the proxy is going to be sitting inside an organization. So uh, an example would be. As Concordia students, you're researching your final project. Um, Concordia pays for like uh, licensing fees to say IEEE or ACM or different people that publish papers, right? Uh, and so if you are on the Wi-Fi here, you should be able to just go directly to IEEE and, and download the PDF, okay? It just sees, oh, you're coming from an IP address that's within Concordia's network, therefore you, you will give you access to it. Now, if you're at home, you can't do that, right? Uh, so what a VPN would do is you would VPN into a service, a computer that's running within Concordia's network that Concordia is providing. Uh, and then now your IP address looks like it's coming from Concordia, and so you can access that information. So the library used to, anyways, they used to make you use a VPN. There, there's other ways of doing it, like easy proxy, which sounds like a proxy server. It's not exactly that way, but anyways, there's, there's different ways of, um, actually, I guess easy proxy is literally a proxy. Um, it just works differently because you, you put where you're going in a URL as opposed to in the browser settings. But anyway, so you, you might have some sort of client, um, but yeah. So these, these details don't matter. I just want to get you used to the idea that you need to do something client side. You need to install it or configure or something like that, okay, uh, in order to use this type of service. So what you do is you package up your request as if it's going to Facebook, but instead of it going to Facebook, it's going to actually, it's literally going to go to the proxy server instead, okay? So that's what your client's doing. It's, it's rewriting that, that IP address, okay? But inside of your request, is going to be the fact that you want it to go to this ultimate destination, which is Facebook. And then what the proxy will do is it will forward it to Facebook. And so what Facebook sees is they see a request, and if they see the IP address of the request, it's the proxy's IP address, not the user's. Okay, then they send their response back. And by back, they're going to send it to the, the destination uh, the sending, sorry, the sender's IP address, which is the proxy. So it's going to address this to the IP of the proxy. And then the proxy receives it and it's like, oh yeah, that must be matching. This user was asking, you know, they sent a request to Facebook, so this must be the matching response. Uh, and, and then they'll forward it back to you.
Now, generally, what will happen is, uh, in terms of network, uh, network encryption, if you're using VPN, it's an explicit uh, requirement of the protocol. So the P in VPN stands for private, so it's virtual private network. What does private mean? Private means that it's encrypted between you and the proxy server. Okay, so this means it's an encrypted tunnel and it's not using SSL, it's using VPN's own protocol. If you do just a standard proxy server, then it's not necessarily encrypted at all. It might just go over clear text or it, you might use HTTPS in that case. So it's going to depend on how the proxy server is configured, okay? So VPN has its own sort of encryption protocol. It looks, at the end of the day, it looks a lot like HTTPS. It's just um, the packets and stuff are, are different. Um, but anyways, um, so let's just, we'll consider the VPN case. But anyway, so it's, it's encrypted between you and the proxy. Now, what about between the proxy and Facebook? Is that encrypted or not? So the answer is it's going to depend, you want to shoot? No, I just said no. No? Okay, okay. So it, the truth is it actually is going to depend on whether you would normally talk encrypted to that server or not. So if this is Facebook and they're running SSL, then the proxy has to speak SSL to the server, okay? So if the user normally would be using HTTPS to access this, then it will go over HTTPS between uh, the, the proxy and the server. And uh, if it's just a normal HTTP connection, then there won't be encryption at all, okay? So this would be HTTPS if it would be used, un, I'll say unproxied. So if you're not, if you, if the user was just sending it directly, if you use HTTPS, then it will be, it will show up here uh, and it won't, okay? Now the critical piece is that the proxy decrypts everything in the middle, okay? So they, uh, they uh, decrypt, so they can see And, uh, okay, now let's think about this from a privacy perspective. Um, so let's say that you're law enforcement and you're sitting on the wire here, okay? So you see traffic and for some reason that server is, you don't like it, okay? And you wanna go after users who just access that server, okay? So what you'll do is you'll see the proxy server's IP address instead. So you'll go get your warrant and, uh, and then you'll figure out who's the account. You don't know necessarily that it's a proxy server at first, right? Uh, so you'll go get your warrant, you'll go to the ISP, figure out who that IP address belongs to, you'll go knock on the door, and then you'll figure out, oh, this, this person's running a proxy server. It wasn't them that was originating the traffic, they were just proxying it, right? Then what you might do is it depends on how the proxy's configured. So if the proxy wants to protect itself, like Concordia's VPN, they're gonna have a log. They have to have a log in order to do their job of sending information back and forth. They do have to log like who's outbound traffic is going where because when it comes back, they have to send it back, okay? So they have to keep that log at least temporarily just to do its job. The question is, do they retain it, right? Is this something that they're going to keep for a couple months or are they going to delete it an hour later, okay? And so you don't know that as a user, right? So these, so these, you know, some VPNs will say, oh, we don't, we don't keep logs or whatever. So that's fine. If you trust that they say that they don't keep logs, then they don't keep logs, okay? But those logs did exist at some point, okay? And, and you really don't have any idea about whether they're, they're keeping them or not, okay? Um, so they do have this kind of like log of user website. I'll put user server. And then uh, you can think about the retention. Okay, 
And if these are just like free VPNs that you're finding online or something like that, they might even be law enforcement, right? They might, law enforcement might be running it, right? So you, you, you have no idea, okay? Now, why do people, why do people use a VPN? Why, why do they even care about their IP address? So obviously, the reason law enforcement is interesting is some criminal activity, like say the RSA hack, right? Uh, someone broke into the servers, they're gonna wanna use something to hide their IP address because eventually it's going to be, you know, the information is probably logged by RSA, the company. Uh, however, they exfiltrated the data, that's probably going to an IP address. So there's a chance that that IP address is being recorded somewhere. They're going to do a full-fledged uh, like investigation. They'll turn it over to law enforcement to investigate as well. And uh, if that's an IP address in the United States or some company, some country that cooperates with the United States, uh, then you know, then you could the person who did that could have the FBI, you know, knocking down their door. Okay. So criminal activity is one. Now, if only criminals use this, right? then maybe we should just ban it or block it or, or try not to, to do it. So this is the ethical consideration, right? So the ethical consideration is, okay, we know bad people use this, but are there good uses for it? Okay, so for example, if you're in a country and you have censorship, uh, like China, the Great Firewall of China, Iran, uh, different countries, uh, we see it. Uh, yeah, so this can uh, circumvent Censorship. How does it how does it get around censorship? Okay, okay. So it's not so much about the IP address that's important. The the important question is where is the censorship happening? So if the censorship is happening like say here, I'm gonna mess this diagram up, but I'll whoops. I'll I'll delete these lines later. If the censorship is happening here, it doesn't actually help you. Right? Like if, if the government's saying you can't access this server, then it's going to block the proxy from accessing the server just like it would block you from accessing the server. Okay? But if the censorship's happening here, right, then this proxy's outside of the country, right? So if you can get to a proxy that's outside of the country, then there's no censorship between the, the proxy and the server, right? Now the question is, well, is the government going to block you from talking to the proxy? Well, if it's encrypted with VPN, right, then they don't know that you're talking, they don't know what you're talking to, okay? Now they might decide we're gonna ban all encrypted traffic or all VPN traffic or whatever, right? So then what projects will do, like Tor in particular, is they'll have, they'll make this network connection look just like normal, it's gotta be encrypted, but they'll make it look like normal encrypted traffic. It just looks like HTTPS. It just looks like you're, this is a website and you're going to it over HTTPS, but in reality, it's actually a proxy server, okay? Now, if the user has the IP address, the user has to know where to send the information, right? So the user has to have the proxy address's IP address. So where does the user get a list of proxy service, right? So in Tor's case, it's, Publish. There's a public list, right? Well, then what the government can do is they can just block all of those proxy servers, right? They know all the IP addresses of every Tor server, so they just block them all. So then what Tor will do is they'll say, okay, we're going to have some secret like Tor nodes that we're not going to publish publicly, and we're going to like hand them out literally by hand, Right? So we're going to go into a country, we're going to work with whatever, human rights groups or whatever, we're going to give them a list of these things, they, they call them bridges, and they're going to distribute it to people that they trust to use it, but it's not going to be written down anywhere. And of course, if the government gets it, then they can block all those IP addresses, but the idea would be that you could give out enough of them if you have enough of these things, okay? So keep that in the, the back of your mind, that's called a bridge. Um, so that's specifically, so, you can evade censorship pretty easily if the government's not really paying attention. They don't know that you're talking to a proxy server, then that's fine. But if the government's paying attention and they're, they're actively trying to stop you from uh, talking to proxy servers, uh, then you need to have a proxy server that you know about that the government doesn't know about, okay? Um, anyways, we'll see bridges when we, uh, when we actually install Tor, it's, it's going to ask us some things about bridges, if I, if I recall correctly. 
Okay. Uh, what? What? Why else do people use VPN? So evading censorship, uh, criminal activity. Okay. If Okay. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah, so, so the idea of a VPN is to sort of extend the, the safe zone of the network. It's meant so that you can work from home on your own device and bring your device as if it's in the network even though it's not in the network. Yeah, so that's another use. And then there's one other use that, that I guess is like, well, there, there's probably lots of different uses, but the, there's one huge category of use. If you go like Google, like free VPN, all those VPNs are marketed to you for one purpose only. Uh, and it's kind of quasi illegal. It's, it's like technically illegal, but no one really cares about it. It's not, it's like a law that no one cares about. So what is it? No, that, not the one that I'm thinking of. Sort of related, not quite. Okay, it's usually because I want to watch a soccer game that's like, I don't know, broadcast for free in Mexico, but because I'm not in Mexico, I can't do it. Okay, so we call it geo, geo blocking. Okay, yeah, geo blocking's the thing. Oh, geo hopping. Yeah, yeah, exactly, geo hopping. Yeah, so that's, anyway, that's, that's the uses of it. So you can have things that are strictly criminal. You can have things that are kind of like gray zone, like geo-hopping. And then you could have good uses like anti-censorship. Uh, Whistleblowing, maybe like say you uh, you know that a company is doing a bad thing, so you're trying to leak it to the press or to the government or something like that, uh, but you don't want to say who you are because you're going to get fired, or you, there could be some retribution uh, from the company. Uh, then you might want to do it anonymously, so you might want to pay attention to your, your traffic, especially if you're doing it from within the organization because the files that you're sending are coming from within the organization or something like that, um, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, so a VPN and a proxy, let's just consider it. Basically, the only difference is really how the encryption is done here. That's, so VPN is its own protocol, so it runs on its own port with its own protocol. And with a proxy, you might use HTTPS. So it might look more, more like a, a standard connection. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the, maybe I didn't finish this uh, sort of thought, but the proxy is going to have a log of what user is accessing which server, right? So, yeah, the government will start at the server. Then they'll say, okay, I see these requests and responses traffic. I see this IP address. So let me go figure out who that IP address is. Then they show up at the proxy and they say, right, we want to see your list. And if the proxy is like, here's my list, then they can trace it back to you. And if the proxy server is like, well, I deleted my list, right? Then there might, they might say something about whether they should be deleting lists in the future, right? But the, the information's gone and then, and then the user's protected in that case, right? So basically all your trust is being piled onto the proxy, right? So uh, if you trust the proxy, then it works fine. And if you don't trust the proxy, then. They, they have all the details about the, the proxy. So they, they have had it at some point, yeah. Yeah, so they, they, they needed to actually do their job. That was the point. So they can't just be like, we're not going to record anything because when they get these responses back, they have to remember who asked for it so that they can forward it to it. So it is being written down at least at the time that connections are open. So for the session length of your session, uh, they're, they're, uh, they have to keep that information. And then the question is how long do they retain it, right? And even if they delete it, like what does that mean? You know, they press the delete button on their server or whatever. Like, they have a script and it just goes through and it RMs that file, right? Is that really deleted? Like, if I pull the hard drive out of that computer, right, and I do forensics on that, like, 
Is it just that the hard drive forgot, like marked that area as you can overwrite it because it's deleted, but it's still sitting there until it gets overwrited? Or is it really deleted, right? And then with SSDs, solid state drives, as opposed to hard drives, that question also changes a bit as well. So um, yeah, so if, if it's a very serious case, law enforcement can go in and they can do forensics on the server as well. They can pull hard drives out. And the answer is that if you just delete something, it doesn't delete it. All it does is it, it forgets about that location. And so the data just sits there until you're ready to overwrite it, at least in traditional hard drives. Yeah. And so you could, uh, like, actually, Apple always gave you the option. I don't know if they still do. Yeah, I don't see it. They, they used to give like a secure empty uh, drive uh, so that basically it would like delete it over and over again. Like it might delete it. Like it, it would go and it would make it all zero and then it would make it all one and then it would make it all zero and then it would make it all one and it would do that like a hundred times or whatever. Um, so anyways. Okay. Uh, okay. So Tor, good or bad or, or VPNs or whatever. Okay. Now, the, the thing, the problem here uh, where it's still kind of weak on security is the fact that all your trust is piled into this one uh, proxy server, okay? So this is what Tor tries to solve. So Tor says, okay, can we do a better proxy server where uh, you don't have to pile all your trust into one, okay? Now, one idea you might have is, well, what if you use two proxy servers, right? Like you send your traffic to one proxy, they send it to another proxy, and then it goes off to the website, right? And let's say those two proxies are ones in, I don't know, Europe and ones in Australia or something like that. There's different laws that govern them, different law enforcement, things like that, right? Then it's going to get hard uh, to, to trace back traffic, okay? So that's the idea of Tor. Uh, and so what they do is they, um, they have a bunch of proxy servers. And so uh, often Tor will use the term node instead of proxy, but it effectively is working the same way. And they might have like a secret list of nodes. So I don't normally put this in, but I'll, I'll put it in here. And these are called bridges. Okay, and so when you're a user, what you'll do is you'll install your client. Okay, and we'll, we'll look at what that looks like. And now what your traffic's going to do is it's going to be sent through a couple of these nodes. So the default is it chooses three nodes. It chooses it kind of at random, but there's some red tape about how it chooses it. Uh, but let's say that it picks this node, this node, and then this node. And there's a, it picks a path as well. So it's going to explicitly send it to node one, node two, node three, okay? And if you're using a secret bridge, you have to type the bridge address in yourself. Then Tor will first send it to a bridge, and then the bridge will send it through Tor, okay? So the idea is that if censorship is happening here, then you can, uh, you can step out of your country into a bridge, and then you can access Tor normally. But uh, we'll ignore bridges for now just to keep it simple. So my traffic goes here, then it goes here, then it goes here, and then it goes here. So this is sometimes called the entrance node. This is called the exit node. And then your middle nodes are just, I don't know, middle nodes or something like that. Okay. Now, the next thing that's kind of hard to draw, but I'll, I'll do my best, 
is you're going to use encryption just like VPN. The encryption, actually it's based on HTTPS, but it's technically Tor's custom implementation. So it, they, they use HTTPS in the end, but the way that they kind of layer their encryption is, is Tor's own protocol, okay? And so what they do is they, um, is they say, okay, I've chosen this path, okay? So I'm gonna send it to node one, node two, node three, and uh, what Tor's client will do is it will take your traffic and at first it's going to encrypt it for node three. Okay, so it's going to take your traffic, the fact that you wanna to go to Facebook or whatever the server is here, and they're going to encrypt it for node three. And critically, it's not We'll encrypt it for node one, node one will re-encrypt it for node two, and node two will re-encrypt it to node three. Okay, that's not what's happening. What's happening is it's being end-to-end -end encrypted to node three, okay? So these people in the middle can't decrypt that at all, okay? Um, so, so, so that happens, okay? Now, the problem with this is, let's say you're node one, right? you don't know to forward it to node two or you don't know to node forward it to node three because that's under encryption now, okay? So what we do is we encrypt a second packet that basically says node two, I want you to forward this to node three, okay? This, this inner blue thing, you can't read it because it's encrypted for node three, but I, I, want you to, uh, I want you to forward it. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna encrypt that for node two. So this is like a special instruction that goes to node two that basically just says, hey, node two, take the blue thing that's inside of me and forward it on to node three, okay? And then similarly, node one doesn't know how to send it to node two, so we do the same, we do the same thing again. And so we have this outer layer of encryption that goes all the way here, okay? So the packet that you create here, it's kind of like, um, it's like encrypted for node three. And inside of it, it's a, there's special routing information that's encrypted for node two. And inside of that, there's special routing information that's encrypted to node one. Okay, so you kind of have like a tunnel inside a tunnel inside of a tunnel. This looks kind of like an onion. So the, the original idea is, uh, it was called onion routing. Uh, so you would create these nested encryptions and then every node would peel a layer off. Okay, so the first node's going to peel out the outer layer, then the next node will peel off the next layer, then the next node will peel off the next layer, and then you'll finally figure out where the traffic's going and you'll send it off to Facebook or whatever, okay? Uh, the Tor, Tor itself stands for the Onion Router originally, but now they just say, oh, it's just Tor, it's not that. But anyways, the, the original, ac it was originally an acronym that stood for the Onion Router and this idea of an onion is this type of thing itself, okay? Now, you might have HTTPS layered underneath all of this, okay? So once again, just like in the proxy scenario, it depends on whether if you were going over Tor to an HTTPS website, if you weren't using Tor and you'd normally be going over HTTPS, when you use Tor, it will also go over HTTPS, okay? And so HTTPS in this case would look like, it's maybe a little dark. it would look like something that goes end-to-end -end all the way here. Okay. 
Okay, now let's look at any particular node. So pick node two. So just like in the proxy example, node two needs to figure out, it needs to record some information so that it can, you know, it's sending these packets back and forth. So it needs to know where they're coming from, and where they're going, okay? All node two knows is that I'm receiving some packets from node one, okay? I don't know that it's coming from the user ultimately. All I know is I'm getting packets from node one and I'm sending my packets to node three, okay? So it doesn't know the user and it doesn't know Facebook, okay? Node three knows, oh, I'm receiving some information from node two and I'm sending it to Facebook, for example. Okay, so it knows somebody who's using Tor is talking to Facebook, but it doesn't know who, okay? And then node one knows uh, that the user is using Tor, right? So they see the IP address of the original user, but they only know that they're sending information to node two. Okay, they don't know that it's ultimately ending up at Facebook, okay? So everyone just has this local view of the network, okay? So now let's say that you're law enforcement or someone who's spying or whatever, and you want to backtrace this traffic, right? You have to trace it. You would start at the server, and then you'd say, okay, that traffic's going to node three. Then you go to node three, and they would say, well, I got it from node two. Then you go to node two, and they would say, I got it from node one. Then you go to node one, and they would say, I go to, to the user, okay? So you would have to compromise every single node along the path. Then you could break the anonymity uh, of Tor, okay? So the assumption basically is that it's hard to break uh, the anonymity of all three of these servers. And what Tor will do is it will purposely pick servers in different continents around the world. So your traffic's gonna bounce around. It's not gonna send it to three American servers, okay? It's gonna send it uh, back and forth uh, between different countries, hoping that, that at least there's, it, it's hard to basically monitor traffic uh, from all three countries, okay? So, so that's it in a nutshell. Um, now, the, Tor isn't perfect, so there's, there's a bunch of ways of breaking it. Probably the easiest way to break it is, uh, well, first off, is, is there any questions about this? Just make sure it's clear. Yeah, so the question is you being where, who wants to do it in this picture? Yeah, so the user does. So their Tor client knows it picked, to send it to node three, I need node three's key, right? And to send it to Facebook, I need Facebook certificate and things like that. So the client itself has a complete view of its path. So it knows everything that's, <coughs> it knows all three nodes that it's using. It's not like it just sends it to node one and says, send it to some other node, right? Uh, the client is going to pick all three of the nodes, yeah. So it can see it can see all three of them. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Um, okay. But the the point is, I guess, two things. One is that all the negotiation, like give me your certificate, that has to happen over Tor as well. Okay. Or even the setting up, like, hey, Node One, I want you to connect to Node Two. That already happens over Tor. Like you can't you can't just say Node One, Two, Three. Let's all use Tor and then turn Tor on because then those three nodes are going to know that it's coming from you, okay? So the user never directly sends a packet ever to node three. It only ever sends a packet when it, like through node two and then through node one, yeah? So the way the, the thing works is basically at the handshake stage, you start talking to node one, you go back and forth, you get your crypto channel established. And then once you have it, you say, I want you to connect to node two and then you start sending node one the information to relay to node two, and you do a handshake between node two. So now you have an end-to-end -end encrypted packet to node two, and then you do the same thing basically to node three. You tell node two, you don't tell node one it, 
you just node one's just now blindly forwarding everything to node two. So you tell node two, I want to talk to node three, and then you do the handshake to node three. Yeah. And then the other thing I didn't explicitly say, but uh, packets, just like in the proxy servers, they can they can come back, right? So obviously, otherwise the whole thing doesn't work. So Facebook here, it doesn't know that it's talking to Tor, right? It just knows that this IP address of N3 asks for this information. So it sends the information back to node three. Node three wrote down, oh, I, I have an open session ID to, to Facebook. And so when I get traffic back, I need to send that for node three. But because this is Tor now, this inner protocol is Tor, I'm gonna send it over Tor, Tor's protocol. So I'm gonna re-encrypt it basically. So I'm gonna encrypt the response to node two and it's going to get encrypted to node one. And what happens is it's really complicated, but the user leaves a kind of key to be encrypted that ultimately ends at the user, even though node three doesn't know who the user is. So the, the backward, it's easy to understand the forward protocol. The backwards protocol is a little, um, it's a little trickier to understand. But, but anyways, there's, there's a way to get this information back to the user. Yeah. Yeah. So let's assume the opposite. So let's assume that you go to node one and you say, hey, I want to pass between you, node two, and node three, right? Okay, so then what happens is uh, law enforcement, they come to Facebook and they see, oh, there's traffic to node three, okay? Then they go to node three and they say, ah, this person's using Tor. Node three is a Tor node, right? I just have to find the entrance node because if I can find the entrance node, it knows all the nodes all the way down, right? So I'm going to go to, I'm going to try all these nodes until I find the right entrance node. And then when I find it, then I'll, uh, then I'll be able to, to figure it out. Okay. Now we're, we're, we have been talking about law enforcement starting with the server, but that's not the only case. Law enforcement also, they might have you under investigation, right? So they see that you're using Tor, right? So in this case, they know you're doing something, but they don't know what you're doing, right? So if node one knew the whole path, right? Then they would, they, they, if they're sitting here, they know that you're talking to node one. So they'll go to node one and then node one will say, oh well, yeah, I know everything about this. You know, they're going to node two and then they're going to node three and then they're going to Facebook or whatever. Then, then law enforcement's done. They just have to go to node one and, and get that information. Yeah. So, so the whole point is to have the security be, uh, I'll flip it around and say, if any one of these is trusted not to reveal the information, then the whole connection is trusted. Yeah, so you, you have to compromise every node. So as long as you have one honest node, then you're, you're anonymous. As, yeah. Okay, uh, other questions? Yeah, so this, it's just that every node knows, so this, your IP address is known by node one. Yeah, so node one knows your real IP address. It just doesn't know what website you're visiting to, okay? So when it comes back, it will go to node three, node three knows to send it to node two, node two sends it to node one, and then node one knows your IP address. But the, the critical point is that node two doesn't know your IP address. Node three doesn't know your IP address. Facebook doesn't know your IP address. All these other nodes that aren't on your path, they don't know your IP address, right? So the only person that knows your IP address is, is node one. And even though they know your IP address, they don't know where you're going ultimately, right? So you can't do that end-to-end -end tracing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So you can go through the list and say, I want these nodes. So the client will do it automatically for you, but if you wanna override it or, if you have nodes that you trust or you want to make sure that, that you always use this one entrance node or whatever, that's, that's, you can configure that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so Tor is pretty good. Uh, so you'd have to compromise all three nodes to trace traffic all the way through. Now, anonymity is kind of a tricky concept, but 
Uh, when we talk about anonymity, we usually talk about it in the context of what we call an anonymity set. Okay? So if I'm anonymous, it usually, sometimes it could be like, oh, there's this message that was sent, it's anonymous. It could have been sent by anyone in the world. I have no idea who it was sent by. Okay? Often anonymity is not that strong. Anonymity is like, there's a hundred people that could have sent that message. I don't know which one sent it, but it was one of these hundred people. Okay? So that's, that's the idea of an anonymity set, is you're anonymous within a crowd, right? So all people who could have sent a message, or I'll say sent a packet, but it, it could be anything. Right? Like say you run an election and then you see that one person voted for this one candidate, right? Well, it, the person that voted for that candidate had to be one of the persons who voted, right? You don't know who it was, but like if someone didn't even vote in the election, then it obviously wasn't their vote, right? So the anonymity set would be all the people who voted in that election, okay? So what about Tor? What's the anonymity of set of Tor? Well, the anonymity set of Tor is all the users that are using Tor at that particular time. So if Tor traffic happens to start hitting Facebook server, right? if somehow you were on the other end of the line and you saw, oh, there's, there's 100 people that are using Tor right now, you know it's one of those 100 people. You just don't know which one it is. Okay? So your anonymity set is basically uh, all people using Tor. Okay, so the anonymity is not perfect, right? So it's only hiding your IP address and your anonymity set is only the, the set of all other Tor users, okay? And so this is something that people don't always get. Case in point, uh, at MIT, there was uh, one year, uh, someone didn't want to write their final exam, so they decided that they're going to uh, say that there's a bomb in the building, okay? Then the building gets shut down and the exam gets canceled, okay? Now, they decide that normally you might phone it in or something like that. They decide they're going to email it, okay? Now, they don't want to get caught doing it, right? Uh, and so they're very smart, so they use Tor, okay? So they created a brand new Gmail address that, like, they just registered it under, like, a fake name or whatever, and then they send an email to the, the administration using Tor, okay? Now, is there no way to tell who that user is? Okay. Now, remember, the anonymity set is just the people using Tor at that time, okay? Now the student, they made one mistake, which is that they sent the email from the university network, okay? So the university had a record of basically all the network traffic that was in the university network, okay? So what they did is they said, hmm, was anyone, we, do, we can't trace it, we can't trace this, like the email has an IP address, I don't know if you know that, but I, e emails have IP addresses of the last person that sent. So they have Node 3's IP address, they notice that it's a Tor node, so they know it was sent through Tor, and even with all the network traffic logs and all of that type of stuff, they couldn't tell which Tor user sent that message, okay? So I'm not saying they could backtrace it, but what they did is they looked and they saw, oh, there's actually only one user in the entire university that happened to be using Tor at that particular time, okay? Now remember, your anonymity set is the people using Tor at that time. There's only one, right? Someone was sending a packet at the exact instant that this email was coming in, right? So they found who it was, right? Now, they, it's not definitive proof, right? They might have said, oh, it's a coincidence. You know, I, I was using Tor at that time, but the person who sent the threat, they might have not been on the university campus. They might have been somewhere else, right, sending that information. Or if the person had gone across the street to Starbucks and gone on the Starbucks Wi-Fi, then you couldn't do this. Then the university couldn't do anything about it, okay? Uh, but because they sent it from within the university network and they had an anonymity set of one because they were the only user, then the university was able to link them. They brought them in for questioning and then they admitted uh, to it uh, at the time. Yeah, so, so then if you have two users, then you know it's one of the two. But, and you, you don't even strictly know, because like I say, it could be one user who's using Tor for something else on the university network. And the bomb threat could be sent by someone who's not on the university network. 
it just seemed logical that because it was a student that maybe they used the university network to send it. And so that, so like I say, it's not definitive proof, but it was enough to bring the student in. And once they came in, they kind of knew that they, they couldn't lie their way out of it. And so they, they, they admitted to it as a result. Yeah. Okay. Now, another thing that's pretty powerful against Tor is let's say you can't compromise all three of these nodes, but let's say you can watch the traffic here and you can watch the traffic here. Okay. Now, this is kind of like the university network. Like they have timestamps of traffic here. And because it was an email being sent to the university server, email server, then they have timestamps of traffic here. Okay. Then it's pretty easy to see oh, a packet goes in, like a packet of this length. You know, remember those fingerprinting attacks that we talked about with SSL, right? So I'm, I'm sending like five packets of these lengths. They're going into Tor. And then, you know, three seconds later, that exact pattern sort of comes out and it goes to a server. And then the response comes back as 40 different packets, right? And then lo and behold, there's 40 packets that are being sent to the user here, okay? So we call that a global adversary in the sense that they can, they can see the, the entrance and the exit. And in that case, you can basically break Tor just based on timing information. So you can, uh, you can do like a, a fingerprinting attack. Um, so Tor doesn't work well in that, that scenario either. So generally, Tor assumes that, that an adversary is not capable of doing that. And it will do some things to try and obfuscate it, like bundling packets together and things like that. But um, researchers keep proving that you, you know, you can basically you can fingerprint traffic. <laughs> okay, so this is how Tor works. Uh, this is the anonymity, you know, sort of guarantees. Okay, well, whatever. Uh, are there any questions about Tor or its anonymity? Okay, so let's take a 10 minute break and then when we come back, we'll actually install it and we'll think about how usable it is to install it and use it. All right. Okay, so we'll do the cognitive walkthrough. All right, so just as a reminder, we're going to go out, we're going to grab Tor. Uh, C1 and C2 are kind of the same now, uh, so we'll kind of blend these two together. Uh, it used to be different. If you're really curious, you can read the paper from back then. Uh, and then we'll try C3 and C4 as well, okay? So I'm going to do it in a lot less detail than for your project. Uh, we'll, we'll do it really fast, but, uh, and then the paper that this is from is much more detailed, sorry, than your assignment. Uh, so your assignment should be more detailed than what we do in class, but less, it doesn't have to be as detailed as the paper itself, so somewhere in the middle, okay? And uh, these are the court, or the guidelines. Uh, we talked about them last time. You'll see them, we'll keep referring back to them as we go through, um, so it will, We'll be okay. All right. Um, okay, so I'm a user. My friend said, oh, you want to do something anonymously, you should use Tor. That's all I know. I know how to spell it. I don't know anything else about it. Okay, so what do, what do I do? I want to use Tor. So we have to get it, right? So what, where do we get it from? Okay. All right, so I'm gonna use my trusty friend Google. Whoops. And I'm gonna ask for Tor. 
Okay, so that's fine. Uh, it comes up. Uh, it's the first, the first uh, link, so I can go to the website. Okay, so uh, browse privately, explore freely, defend yourself against tracking and surveillance, circumvent censorship. So these are things that we, we talked about. Download Tor browser, download Tor browser. So the website's pretty obvious, right? Probably not much to report. I'm just going to click on it. I'm going to choose my uh, operating system. What do you want to talk about for three minutes? OK, while we're waiting, we can just sort of bum around the website a bit. Yeah, exactly. So they're they're literally handed out by hand. So like the tour, basically you could say, hey, I want to run some bridges from Concordia or whatever. And then you would contact the people at tour, like Roger Dingledine or whoever, and say, hey, Roger, I I'm, want to run some bridges. And then, uh, and there might be an automated way of doing it where you can just through the software say, I want to run a bridge. I can't remember. But anyways, then the tour people themselves will get the list of bridges and then it's like they know people, like say you want to go into China and you want to circumvent the, the firewall in China, then they'll know people on the ground that they just know personally and they think that they're humanitarians or whatever. They'll say, here's, here's 100 bridges and then hand them out as, as ever, however you see fit. And then it becomes like a people to people kind of problem, right? Um, so it's, it, that's how they're distributed literally, right? And so if you know a person who knows a person who knows one of these bridge addresses, then, then you can get it. And then uh, more than one person can use the same bridge. And uh, anyways, the bridges are like a finet like it's not Tor's main thing, right? Like Tor's main thing is just working in countries where there aren't censorship. That was just sort of a workaround because they had so many people coming uh, that wanted to use it in, in countries that were heavily censored. And so they, they come, came up with this idea. But yeah, basically, like if the government knows everything that you know, you're not going to evade censorship, right? And so there has to be some information that you know that the government doesn't know. And then, so in this case, it's as simple as a, an address, right? And if you know that, and even the address format, it's not, it doesn't look like, it's not like an IP address or something. It's just like a random set of characters or something like that. And, and then you just type it in and then the Tor software figures it out. Uh, we can see here, uh, let's just look at a few things. So uh, how's it different from other proxies? And basically the, the key idea is that you have three different servers and uh, you can't compromise it unless if you compromise all three of them. Uh, entry guards is another term for entry nodes. So I call them entry nodes, but they're the first node uh, in the network. Um, what Tor will do too is it will kind of refresh your circuit. So you'll choose three nodes, you'll keep those for 30 minutes, and then you'll tear it down and you'll choose another three nodes. So you're kind of always changing it. Um, but entry nodes, because they see your IP address, they're kind of like slightly more privileged because they at least know that you're using Tor. And so you, t you tend to not tear down you're in, you might use the same entry node a couple times so that you, you're not uh, going through uh, them. Let's see how often. So sorry, it's every 10 minutes uh, it will reuse the same circuit. And then uh, it's looking to see if there's something about bridges. But there probably is something about it here, but I can't see it. Oh, here's a bridge. So bridges are relays that are not listed in the public Tor directory. Uh, anybody can run a bridge, so there's, there's instructions for it. 
Um, yeah, so it seems that they're saying that in China and Iran, those are the two countries I mentioned, that there are, they somehow figured out how to like wholesale block Tor bridges. I guess they can tell that, oh, this is traffic to Tor uh, as opposed to, you know, what exactly it is. But then there's some other stuff that you can do that may or may not work. Sorry, sorry. I'm asking like to now you can use for China to get to block the tour. You mean if you're in China or Iran? Yeah, so you can't all of Tor is blocked. So if you don't use a bridge, it's just going to be blocked. Okay. And then the bridge was meant to make the traffic between you and your bridge was supposed to look like normal traffic, right? And so somehow it's it's not quite normal enough. And so they're able to distinguish it. And so they just write a network rule that, yeah, kills it. And then what these things are doing is they're layering some other level of encryption on top to try and blend the traffic in. And, and eventually the government will warm up to this and then they'll block it. And so these things sometimes add, end in like a cat and mouse kind of game. Yeah. OK, anyways, uh, we, we have this uh, downloaded. So let's go grab it. Okay, so the, the installation procedure, if you're used to Apple, you've seen this kind of thing before, you just drag and drop it. While we wait, we could put this in. This is tan standard, whatever. Okay, uh, so the next thing I see is I see a little error message here. Okay, Tor Browser is an app downloaded from the internet. Are you sure you want to open it? Uh, so this is a standard Apple thing. Uh, so it just warns you about uh, installing different apps. Is there any way that we could suppress this warning if we wanted to? Say we're Tor and we really didn't want, we didn't want to scare users off with a warning like that. Is there anything we can do? Exactly, yeah, okay, good. So, uh, so there is a way to avoid this, to suppress it. So we could suppress with either uh, a code signature. So we could register with Apple and say, okay, we, we're signing our software. Now this has other advantages as well, because then you also know that malware didn't change. There's no malware in it or whatever. You're getting it from the true source. Uh, and then the App Store does this sort of automatically. So if you don't want to mess around with this, you can just distribute it through the App Store. And it uh, forces you to create an account, which ends up code signing it, and it's registered to your account and things like that. And you don't, even if you don't really understand what's going on, it basically does this for you. Okay. Otherwise, we can open it. Now, the, these warnings used to be worse. The, they actually would not allow you to open the software. So they would just say, Oh, this is downloaded. It's not. It's from an untrusted source, and all you could do is close it. But then to get around it, if you right-clicked and you chose open instead of double-clicking, then it would give you the option of whether you want to proceed anyway. So that was their way of like separating simple users from expert users. But uh, now, anyways, it, there's so much software that that you install that that isn't signed. Um, that it's yeah. No one really cares. Apple doesn't care as much about it. Okay, so here we are, we're in Tor. Uh, Tor is a browser, 
Uh, so it used to be that you would plug your existing browser into it. So if I use Safari, I'm going to use Safari with it. Um, but in this case, uh, I, it has its own whole browser with it. So this is basically Firefox. It's just kind of skinned a little differently. Okay. So the first task, we basically, we've installed it. I don't know if we configured it yet. Like we're not, do, do you feel that we're on tour now? based on what you're seeing? No, like it's pretty obvious that we're not. Okay, so we're still somewhere in CT1 or CT2 uh, configuring it. Um, and so it's saying, okay, if you wanna connect to Tor, uh, you, you know, basically just click this button. Uh, so that's good. Okay, so Tor Browser routes your traffic all over the Tor network, which is run by thousands of volunteers around the world. Uh, you can override the default, uh, so always connect automatically. Uh, then we have two options. We can configure connection or we can just press the button and connect. Now, one of the, the guidelines of usability, uh, every time I scroll it, it's dangerous. Okay. Users should be aware of the steps that they have to perform. So we know that we want, it, we want to get Tor running at a high level. So we know what it is that we want to do. Now, do we know how to do it, right? So that's uh, G2. So we should be able to determine the steps. And so what I like about this screen is it's clear to me that, that I ha I'm not yet connected, right? Because it's telling me to connect it. And it's also telling me how to do it because there's a button there that's purple that says connect, okay? So it's very obvious what I want to do. If I want to connect to it, I'm going to press this button, OK? So this is good uh, in terms of G2. And I also know I can, well, I can sort of infer from this that I'm not yet connected. So I know that I'm not, not connected yet. And there's another one. I won't, I won't keep going back and forth, but it's uh, G7, G8 which says uh, users should be aware of the application's status at all times. Okay, so in this case, we're not, whether we're connected or not connected, we should always know. I should always be able to look at this and figure out, not at this, but look at the software and say, um, yes, I'm connected, no, I'm not. Okay, so right now I know I'm not connected, so that's good. I know what the next step is, so that's good. So let's uh, press the button and see what happens. Okay, once again, same thing. I know now that I'm not, um, I still know that I'm not connected, right? I press the button, it said connect, right? But it's still thinking about it, right? It's establishing a connection. Uh, so I know that, that even though I press the button to say connect, I, I'm not yet, I'm not anonymous yet, okay? So it's still, I'm still not connected. Okay, now I know because I do this every year what's happening. Um, okay, so it's sitting here, it's establishing a connection. Uh, how long should this take? I've never used, you've never used the software before. Is this something that takes a couple seconds or is it like we've been sitting here, I don't know, it's probably been 30 seconds. Is that normal? Is there something weird going on? Okay, yeah, so that's the answer. So the answer is actually that Concordia blocks Tor. Okay, so you can't use Tor, okay? Now, we are sitting here hanging, right? I don't know anything about Tor. There's a thousand nodes, right? Maybe it takes five minutes to connect to these thousand nodes, right? Maybe it takes 20 minutes. I don't know, maybe I need to go get a coffee and then come back and see if it's connected, okay? So there's no timeout. A timeout would be nice. Or some message like to the user, like this, nor you see this sometimes in software, like this normally takes two minutes. Right, so if I'm sitting here, it's been 20 minutes, then I'm starting to think that there's something wrong, okay? So I don't really know that there's something wrong, but there is something wrong, okay? So that's, that's one aspect where it's, it's not great on usability, so we might criticize that. So there's something wrong here, but there's no timeout. 
I'll say it's hanging. And I don't, I don't have an expectation of how much time this should take. <coughs> okay, so this might trap some users. They might sit here forever, okay? Now, uh, sorry, oh yeah, which guideline? Um, let's see. So this is kind of like a non-critical error, so I can recover from it because eventually I'll, I'll just give up. So I would put under G4, maybe. So it's not always clear like which, like the exact guidelines, it's kind of an art and a science as well, right? So main thing is I'm noting the, the different usabilities, but yeah, we'll consider that a non-critical error. Or you could say it's actually G8 as well uh, because it's the status. Like I know it's connecting, but I don't know that it, it's not work. Like I don't know that it's because it can't even reach that first node, right? It's not that it's taking a long time making all these encrypted channels. It's like, the, you know, I, the, the status is that it can't even reach any Tor node at all because the, the whole thing is being blocked. So yeah, you, you could argue that it's G4 or G8 and that type of thing isn't like so important on your assignment. Like, oh, I, I think that's a G3, but you list it as G4. As long as you sort of justify why you think it falls under a particular guideline, then that's fine. The main thing is identifying these these issues. Yeah, yeah, you should say, I mean, if it's obvious, you don't have to say it, but yeah. To some extent, you should should try and justify why it's, why it's a particular thing. Okay, now we can go back here and we can click configure connection as well. So most users aren't going to do this, right? Uh, but you can see there's a bunch of different options here. There is a network test, okay? So um, I can press this test button and see what this does. So I, I know at least I'm online, so it's not that I don't have a network. I'm just not connected to Tor. Um, here's the bridges thing that we were talking about. Um, so you can choose a bridge from their built-in bridges. Uh, so the governments would have a list of these bridges anyways, but maybe it would work if they're just sort of not paying attention. Uh, it looks like there's an online kind of way of requesting a bridge. Um, so anyways, I, I won't go through that whole process. Or you can enter it manually. So this would be like somebody gave you uh, the bridge itself. And I think I said that it wasn't in the format of IP address and port, but it looks like maybe it is in that format. Um, okay, anyways, there's, there's not much here that's going to really help us. So we can go back here. Okay, so we're basically, we're stuck. Okay, so we're never going to connect uh, because of Concordia. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hop off of Concordia's network and I'm going to connect to my phone instead. Okay, so now we can see what this would look like if we weren't uh, at Concordia. Okay, so now I'm going to connect. Uh, you can see that this actually was a progress bar, so I didn't I didn't even realize that until now because it just looked like um, it's actually interesting. Maybe I'll I think we we didn't quite get it in the screenshot, but uh, it was there. It was like purple, like but it just looked like pretty. Like did anyone think that was a status bar? Yeah. You did think it? Okay, okay. So my initial reaction was it's just some like graphic layout type of thing. Uh, there, would there be a way to make it look more like a status bar? Yeah. Absolutely, right? Like, like you could have like a, like an old school like style status bar. Like, like there, there would be ways that that could have looked more like a status bar instead of just like, um, just like a picture. So let's uh, actually for fun. For fun, I'm I'm going to get a picture of that just because it, it was interesting. Okay, so I'm back on the university network, so it's not gonna work, but I just, I wanna get a picture of this. 
Okay, now I want to ask again, just to be clear. People said that they thought that was a sapphire. Is that what you're telling me? You you thought that that little blue purple thing? Yeah. Okay. 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 <laughs> All right, so it's not completely terrible because you notice, some of you noticed that it was a status bar, so that's fine. Uh, but at the same time, it, it definitely could have been clear uh, that it was. Okay, so we do have one of the guidelines concerns uh, what we call cues. Uh, so G7 is meant for this kind of thing. Okay, so in my mind, it could be clear. I did. I just thought it was pretty, but uh, but other people knew knew that it was a status bar. So it's some. So now I'm going to go back on the. I'll go back to my phone, so we can connect to Tor. Okay, so ready. We'll connect. So you can see it happens pretty fast, even though it's a big network and there's thousands of nodes and things like that. It's not something that's meant to take five minutes uh, in order to do. Okay. All right. Uh, so now we have Tor. Uh, or sorry, now that we click the button, this is what we see. So this is kind of like the landing page. Let me uh, just get a bit of this for the notes. So I won't get the whole screen. Okay, so our goal is uh, to connect to Tor, okay? And one of the usability guidelines says that you should know that you completed the task. So that's G3. So. We knew we had to click. We knew what we wanted to do, which was connect. We knew how to do it. We clicked the button. Now we click the button. We're looking at this screen. Do we know that we're connected to Tor? So in other words, is this Tor now? OK, so yes. So how do you know? OK. It says resistant change freedom. Now, it did say that, I think, when we went to Tor's website in the first place, right? Uh, so we saw this here. Are we on tour here? No. no. Okay. So this isn't tour, right? It has the same graphic, but this is tour, right? Okay. So everyone's saying you're, you're talking about this thing. No. no? Right. This. Sorry. Okay. Okay. So so we know the software we're running is tour browser. Uh, so that's the version of the software. But we were running that software before we tried to connect, right? So that's just telling us the version number. So there's a search bar. So I want to search for whatever Toronto FC. Boom. It's slow, by the way, because you're writing. When it, when it works, you're writing through. But did, but did, did that actually go over Tor? That's my question to you, right? It, was that anonymous? I just searched for Toronto FC. Did Concordia see that? Did my ISP, did, did Bell see, see it? OK. OK, so we can check our IP so that, that a sophisticated user might do that. So it's actually fun. Let's, let's try this. Uh, your IP address is unavailable. Although, it, yeah, it does think I'm in Germany. That's what someone was saying, right? OK, so I, I would say that it's it's sort of implied, let's say, so the, the question is G3. 
Okay. Uh, it's sort of implied because I clicked the button and now I'm kind of on the web, right? But at the same time, it's not explicit, right? Could Tor make it more explicit if they wanted to? Yeah, yeah absolutely. They could have a button that says connected, right? Or you are anonymous or status anonymous or something like that, okay? Um, so it's... So when you do these cognitive walkthroughs, you're, you're thinking of recommendations, right? Like the Tor people, they're going to watch this video or whatever. You know, what, what do you want to tell them, right? And so you're, it's not like a critique where you're like, it's not like a movie and you're trying to say bad things about the movie and why you hated it, right? Like that's not the point of the usability, right? It's the, you know, some things are good, some things are bad, some things are in the middle, right? Like, yeah, it probably worked the way it worked, but like they could make it better, right? And so those are, are, are things that you might say. Okay, so you might infer it, this is what this is meant to say, uh, but it could be clear. And one way to make it clearer would to be to have some sort of user interface uh, kind of thing. So like G7, uh, which would be like an, an icon or a status bar or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, so G3 is, uh, do you know that you completed the task or not? And then uh, G7 is the, like, the user interface, are you comfortable using it? It's basically, G7 is where you put all the user icons and the status bars and all that type of stuff. Yeah, so what I'm saying is, for G3, it's not great. Could be better. One way to make it better would be to use G7, like, with a new status bar or something like that. Okay, now if I click here, uh, this does say, well, it says, okay, site information about Tor, this is a secure Tor browser page. I guess that doesn't even really say, right, necessarily that, that it's anonymous, right? It's just saying something more about the page itself. Uh, I can't remember if there was an icon there when I searched. I think it disappeared. Yeah, so here I, it just looks like a standard browser, right? If I didn't tell you this was Tor Browser and you're used to Firefox and you were just like flipping through your windows and you open this up, you wouldn't be like, oh, this is Tor, right, necessarily. Um, okay, now there is a place where you can tell. Uh, so it's actually, it's weird because what they do is they overload the lock icon. So when I, in a normal browser, if I click a lock icon, what am I expecting to see? Certificate information, okay? I don't know that in Tor that that's what I should click on to learn information about whether I'm connected to Tor or not, okay? Now, it does still have certificate information, so I can go here and it says, okay, I'm securely connected to the site. It's verified by DigiCert. I can click on more information and I can view certificate. And so, like, all that, like, standard stuff I could still get to. But what they do is they also put the Tor circuit in here, okay? So this is the clearest um, explanation. It, still, it doesn't say explicitly you're connected to Tor, right? And remember, you guys know what Tor is now. You know, you pick three nodes and you hop through all three. So when you see this, you know, Tor browser, I go to the United States. This is my IP address. It's a guard node. Then I go to Germany with this IP address. Then I go to another node in Germany. And then I go to DuckDuckGo, which is the, the Google equivalent that they're using. Um, to you, this is a clear indication that we're connected, right? Because you can see all the information. Someone also asked, can you, see, can you see the full path? And so this is the whole path, right? But if you don't know anything about Tor, right? This doesn't necessarily, like you don't know that this, you don't know what this is. It's just a bunch of stuff, right? It's a bunch of IP addresses and things like that. You don't necessarily know that, that you're anonymous, okay? So this is good for experts. Okay, 
So the first thing I don't like is that they overloaded the lock icon. So I, I didn't know to look there because that's not normally what's in that menu option, right? Of, of course, most experts aren't going to click on locks. Anyway, that could be a problem in and of itself, right? Is that most people wouldn't even click on the lock, but they overloaded the lock icon. So icons are G7. Um, this to me, it's clear if you're an expert or not like an expert expert, but you know enough, what you know from this class, you could sort of infer, okay, this, this looks like a Tor connection. It's called a circuit and this is what I'm expecting to see, uh, but not, not for a novice. So that's another thing you do is you, uh, when you do a cognitive walkthrough, you sort of put yourself in different shoes. Like I'm a user who knows nothing about it. What would I do? What would I think? I'm a user who kind of knows a bit. I'm an expert user. Sometimes software is just given to expert users, right? It's not even meant to be used for novice users. So what you have to say about what a novice user would or wouldn't do isn't relevant because it's not software for novice users anyways. But Tor is meant for novice users. Everyone should be able to use it. Uh, the, the things like Privacy Guard, uh, the privacy tools that you're going to use, uh, Privacy Badger and, and the things for your assignment, they're also meant for novice users. So you should be thinking about it from the perspective of, of a novice user. Um, okay, so this is still about whether or not we're actually connected to Tor. So that's about G3, which is do we know that we completed that task because our core task was to connect to it. Um, things like circuit is a little jargony like I don't like a circuit I don't really know what that is that's guard I don't know what that is your guard node not sure okay so things like this where they don't explain it in plain English uh, uh, that should be under uh, G6 so G6 says that users should be comfortable with the terminology that are used in any interface dialogues or documentation um, so it's, it's not, even circuit, I don't, I guess circuit's the same here. I'm not sure what that means. But anyways, we, we know what it means, but a normal user isn't going to know what it means. What did they explain from the homepage? Yeah, so they could do that too. So we could look at the homepage, but you see they, they um, actually, so they do have something here, right? So this is actually something we should look at. So they say no to, new to Tor browser. So novice users are new, so they might actually click on this link, right? So... Uh, let's note that. Okay, and what I'm expecting to see, we'll click on it and see what's here, but I'm expecting to see some instructions or some explanation, that, that type of thing. And so we you normally would put that under G2. So G2 says, uh, can you figure out what task you need to perform? So I know I want to connect to Tor. Not sure whether I'm connected or not, so I'm not sure on G3. Um, so what's the next step? How do I figure out whether I'm connected or not? Uh, that's G2. And so uh, this type of thing is, is good for that. OK, so here it says, um, actually, this is interesting. So it says success here. Right, so I, I wonder actually if that, oh no, sorry, this is back in Safari, my bad. I was wondering if that was actually like you're successfully connected to Tor, but it, it actually popped up when it wasn't. Um, okay, so here we have a kind of dialogue that goes through. Um, so there's a bit about Tor itself. Uh, there's what it does to help you So this is okay, but it's kind of jargony still. Like, I don't know that, that anyone like care, like the difference between a VPN. We care because we're computer science or engineers, information system engineers sitting in a classroom. But most people may, may not really even know what a VPN is or things like that. So it's sort of jargony, but uh, this is nice. So here, see your path. For each domain you visit, your traffic is relayed and encrypted in a circuit across three Tor relays around the world. Uh, no website knows where you're connected from. Uh, you can request a new circuit by clicking new cir circuit for the site on our circuit display. And then you can see my path. OK. 
Okay, let's come back to that. Okay, there's this whole thing um, around uh, no script. So I'll, let me just take some notes here. Okay, let's say I go to a website and the website uh, runs JavaScript. Okay, so there's some JavaScript on the website. So I'm visiting the website and there's JavaScript on the site. Where does the JavaScript run? Is it running on the server or is it running on my browser? Okay, so JavaScript is code that is given to me by the server, but the server, uh, but it's actually running on my browser itself. Okay, now what if JavaScript is like, hey, what's my IP address? You know, let I, I want a new variable called X, and I'm going to get the local IP address and put it in that variable. Okay, so it could do that, right? Now, whose IP address goes in that variable? It's the where the JavaScript is running, which is on my computer, so that's my local IP address, right? Then the website just writes it, it posts it back to the website, right? Okay, so that's it's as simple as that uh, if, if you want to evade uh, Tor, right? Um, and so what Tor does is they disable, they want to disable JavaScript completely, right? What happens if you just go start using the web with no JavaScript? Okay. Yeah, okay, so there's going to be lots of, websites are going to be broken, there's a bunch of functionality, it's just not going to work, okay? Um, so what they do is they have no script, which is an extension that lets you, uh, usually it's configured to, to not allow JavaScript by default, but then if the website's broken, you can kind of go in and say, okay, I trust this, I trust this, and I trust this. And then you can turn it on selectively uh, for, for different websites, okay? So JavaScript is a, is a problem Okay, so with no scripts, anyways, you, you'll find that websites are broken. The user may not know how to fix it. Okay, so the user may not know that, oh, I need to allow this JavaScript. So they might not know why. So it's sort of like G1 to G3, but let's just say G1 and G2. Uh, so they, they don't know what they need to do to fix it. They don't know that they need to fix it because they don't know that it's because of broken JavaScript. And then they don't know, oh, I need to go into NoScript and allow this. And then they might trust websites that would compromise their anonymity. And once you do that, you leak your IP address. Once you leak your IP address, you can't get it back. Okay, you can't be like, oh, that, that was a mistake. Let me go back. I'm gonna do I'm gonna turn no script, I'm gonna turn the script off, and then I'll reload the page. No, it's too late. Okay. So sometimes we distinguish between errors where you can make the mistake and that's fine. You can always go back and you can fix it. Like it wasn't connecting to Tor, then I connected to my phone and then it started working. Okay, that wasn't a dangerous mistake. Okay. But sometimes you make a mistake and you can't get it back, right? Uh, so that's the difference between uh, G4 uh, and G5. So a critical error or an error where they can't recover from. So G5 is like the worst thing that you can do from a cognitive walkthrough perspective. So if you have a problem with G5, that's, that's like high critical thing that, that you need to, to fix. Now Tor really can't do much about it. I mean the web runs on JavaScript and JavaScript's dangerous and you know, I, I don't know what people expect them to do about it, but anyways. Um, okay, let me, anyway, so there's, there's some other stuff here. And uh, uh, this was the thing that was supposed to show me my circuit, uh, but it doesn't. It actually just redirects me to DuckDuckGo, um, so that's fine. Um, now, just out of curiosity, does anyone know what's going on in this URL? So this URL looks kind of weird. It actually looks like a phishing website because it's like, uh, a bunch of random characters, and then it has dot onion on the end. Okay, uh, so this dot, first off, the dot onion is a reference to Tor and to the onion that we talked about.
I'm just not going to bother scrolling to it. Um, OK. So what .onion websites are, are they're kind of like Tor in reverse. So Tor, normally, it's about hiding the user's IP address from the server. OK? But what Tor does is they offer a second service that's called Tor Hidden Services. And with hidden services, you can put up a server, and you can have people visit your server, but they don't know the IP address of your server. OK? So across the Tor network, I, there, there is a path through the Tor network that can connect to that server. OK? So the nodes, basically what the server does is it sets up kind of like a circuit. And then it says, instead of visiting me at www.facebook.com, go to um, this address that basically links to the first node in the, in the path, right? So it's, it's that node's uh, sort of the, the entry to the path. And then it has this dot .onion uh, router, which, which tells Tor that that's what it's supposed to do. So what it will do is it will say, hey, I'm trying to connect to some server. I don't know the IP address of the server. But I know that you know the next node in the path. And then that node will forward you to the next node. And then the next node will say, OK, well, I know the next node in the path. And then that last node will know the IP address of the server. And it will send you to the server. But it doesn't know the onion address that's affiliated with it. So it doesn't know that that's Facebook server. It knows it's some onion server. But there, there could be hundreds or a 1,000 onion servers that people are accessing at any given time. So the exit node knows that, oh, I know, I know that somebody is trying to access this onion server, but I don't know which, I don't know who they are, OK? And so this, um, anyways, forget about all the technical things about it. What does that allow you to do? What it allows you to do is, normally if you put up a server, right, you have an IP address. And so someone can find your server, right? They, they can look up your IP address. They can figure out what country you're in. They can go to the ISP. You know, the, there's a way to find your server, OK? Um, but here, what you can do is you can actually host, you have a server that has a website that's running a website, and nobody in the world knows, uh, knows where it is or what its IP address is, right? So the first, like, sort of the most notorious example of where this was used is there was a website called Silk Road, uh, which came out, basically, it combined Bitcoin, which is like a digital currency, with Tor Hidden Services. And so what they said is, let's make an eBay, uh, just like eBay, but instead of selling like trinkets or collectibles or tickets or things like that, we're going to sell drugs, uh, guns, uh, fake passports, fake money, you know, whatever, whatever you want that's illegal. Okay. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to post it on Tor as one of these hidden services. And so even if the FBI want to shut us down, it turned out it was being run out of the United States, but the FBI couldn't figure out, they didn't know the IP address because it was running over Tor. And you could only access it by through Tor. So it, the users had to be on Tor even to access the website in the first place. So basically everyone was using Tor. And then to buy stuff, you would be paying in Bitcoin. And Bitcoin, it's not like truly anonymous, but it has some anonymity features. Um, and so it's, it's not trivial to like look at a Bitcoin transaction and figure out who, who the buyer or who the seller is, right? Then the tricky part is like, how do you get the drugs? Like, so you, you go to the website, you bid on it, you agree on a price, you can send the price, the digital currency, but then they're going to like mail it to you, right? But it turns out that um, there's a lot of inspection of mail when it crosses a border. So if there's mail that's coming into the United States, it's inspected very closely. But let's say that there's, a, there's mail from a US address to a US address or a Canadian address to a Canadian address, then it's not really inspected at all, right? So if you're, if you're sending drugs, for example, within a country, there, there could be inspection. I'm not saying it never happens, but it's, it's, not, it's not closely inspected. Uh, and then people would disguise it, right? So they would put it inside of a toy or make it look like something else and it would be inside of it or whatever and, and, and you would get it. Um, and so, yeah, it, it took, the FBI basically they couldn't shut down the website and then eventually they shut it down because they knew the person who created it their internet handle so they didn't know who the real person was but that person was sort of they had an online presence and they were answering questions and stuff about the website and so they found a very old post before they had created Silk Road where they were trying to find a developer to help develop Silk Road and they put their real email address in uh, and so they were just like, hey, I have this cool project in mind, 
and I need a developer for it, you know, send email to like Ross Albright at gmail.com or whatever it was. And so then the FBI are like, okay, this is probably the guy. And then they did traditional surveillance. Uh, they would see that he would go into a library on a Wi-Fi network and they could see him typing. And then from the network, they could see that he was talking to Tor and he would, you know, he would be updating, like doing stuff on his laptop. And then the, the person running the website would be making updates to the website and things like that. So they could basically infer uh, that it was exactly the right person. Then they used social engineering. So they distracted him when he was sitting there uh, because they didn't want, they wanted to get his laptop while it was logged in. Because if, if it was logged off, there's a chance that there's some sort of encryption or something like that. So they really wanted to, they wanted to arrest him, but they wanted to have it, his laptop open and logged in so that they could, uh, they didn't have to re-log in kind of thing. And so I can't remember what they did, but they had some people go in and create a distraction. And so he was kind of looking at them and then someone went in and grabbed the laptop and other people ran in and, and arrested him in, in the library. But then he got like, I, I shouldn't make this political, but he got a, a super heavy sentence. He was sentenced, he got a life sentence times four or something like that. Uh, and so he's basically in jail. Even if he lived, had four lives, he would be in jail for, for all four of his lives. And so, um, and then now there's a lot of people that think it's too heavy for what he did. But there was also some, he like tried to pay for someone to assassinate some people. And it, the, anyway, the whole thing is like, I think there's, there's, liter there's definitely a Netflix documentary about it that's pretty good. And there was talk about making a Hollywood film about it. I don't know if that ever happened or. Uh, if it's still in development. But anyways, it's, it's a fun story. Then what happens, people copied Silk Road. So Silk Road got shut down, but then there was another one and another one and another one. And eventually, people sort of figured out that the FBI are pretty good about shutting these websites down. And so maybe Tor Hidden Services doesn't work as well as everyone thinks. And so that's kind of like the current thinking is that maybe if the FBI really want to trace uh, uh, traffic through Tor, uh, they're, then they probably can do it because it seems that they have a pretty good track record of shutting these things down. So anyways, that's, that's what a, a dot onion uh, is. Okay, uh, what else can we talk about? So another one of our core tasks is uh, the, the next core task. So basically we're, we're kind of comfortable. We're on tour, it is being anonymized. I don't know how well a novice user can tell it uh, that it's that it's working or not, but it at least is it is actually working. Um, and uh, the last thing we want to do is we want to disconnect from it. Okay, so we want to turn it off or whatever. So how do we how do we stop using Tor? So I want to go back to using just a normal web connection. Okay, so that's how I would see whether I am or not. Yeah. But how do I, if I just want to go to DuckDuckGo, not through Tor, how do I do it? Let's say. Okay, but where's, okay, so where's the login? Okay, so I close the browser. Okay, so Tor has this mental model. It's, it's so obvious that that's why you're not getting the answer, but let's just clarify it because for a novice user, it might not be obvious. Um, if I want to exit Tor, I just close the browser, right? It's that simple. Now, let's say the browser is open now and I am on Tor, right? Everyone agrees that I'm on Tor, yeah? So if I just go over to Safari, right, and I go to Google, I'm still on Tor, right? What if I open my email, I check my email from my, not through Gmail, but like through my mail client. Is that over Tor? But Tor is on and it's running and look, I, I have a circuit, look. Okay, okay, okay. So everything in Tor is anonymized and anything outside of Tor is not anonymized, okay? So that's the, that we call those mental models. So it's a mental model of how it works. And you just want to be clear, like maybe to everyone in the room that's obvious, but it's not necessarily going to be obvious to everyone else, right? Someone might be like, I want to email that bomb threat into MIT, right? So I heard about this Tor thing. So they, they get Tor browser running, they figure out it's connected, and then they go over to their mail client and they type the email and press enter, right? Like that's like people think that way, right? They, they don't necessarily have the right mental model, okay? Um, so the mental model. So this is sort of, this is kind of like CT4 
kind of, I don't know, it's just another usability point that maybe doesn't clearly match one of the CTs. Um, okay, so mental model is that everything in Tor browser, I'll just put TB, is anonymous when connected. And then everything else isn't. OK, so let me ask you one other question about this. Um, OK, so I just uh, connected to duckduckgo.com. What did, what did I actually do? Break that down a little bit slower. What did my computer do? So it, it went to the server duckduckgo.com, right? So was that the very first packet that I sent? OK, what, what did I have to do before I went there? OK, uh, in terms of, I, I just decided I want it, like, uh, OK, I have this type. This is typed into my URL button, OK? I am pressing the Enter button right now. Where did that first packet go when I pressed Enter? There, one packet went somewhere before it went to duckduckgo.com. Now, it might not have because it got cached, because this is my second time visiting the website. But where, where do we have to go? OK, DNS, OK? Now, is DNS anonymous? Is it over Tor? No, why not? So let's say Concordia is spying on me. They might, this is all anonymous, right? But I can't even go to Silk Road or DuckDuckGo without hitting DNS, right? So they might not know, they might not be able to link my traffic to that website, but it's good enough if they just know that I'm looking up the domain name for Silk Road, right? Yeah, so that's another good question. So on a VPN, are your VPN DNS queries over the VPN or do they happen on the side? What about the user interface? What does it tell us? Nothing, right? Okay, so you'd have to be like, you'd have to know enough about the network to even ask the question, right? Like most people don't know what DNS is or that it's even involved. But if you can get to that point where you can ask the question about DNS, then it, it doesn't really help you. And so the answer is that this does actually anonymize your DNS lookups, okay? So it does do it, and it would be pointless if it didn't. And in the old version of Tor, before it was a browser, the big trouble was actually getting your DNS over Tor. So it was relatively easy to get your browser over Tor. You just go into browser settings and you would it would say, okay, copy this IP address into this field or whatever. You press enter and then that's it. But getting your DNS to go over Tor was like really complicated. You had to install this extra tool, Privoxy and things like that. So in if you read the original paper that I wrote like 10 years ago or whatever, you would see a lot about configuring DNS because that was like the main pain point. But, The, sorry, the public DNS. So I don't know. So I think it's probably internal to Tor. So in the previous one, it was just that your, see the problem with DNS too is that it goes over UDP as opposed to TCP. And so it would, it would literally go through Tor the same way that um, your traffic would. So if we go back to uh, this diagram, this would just be a DNS server, right? So you would just send your packet, it would go all the way through Tor, then it would go to your DNS server, and this could be your local DNS server, like your ISP, the one the ISP gave you or whatever. It would just pop out over Tor, and then it would send the back to node three, and it would eventually find its way back to you. Now, today, I don't know what they do uh, under the hood. So um, they may just run their own DNS servers within Tor itself. Uh, that. Yeah, yeah, but the, the point is they don't know which user, like if, if I'm sitting here anyways, I already know, like if I'm sitting at the exit node, I know, oh, this person's going to Facebook, this person's going, because I can see that traffic. So it doesn't seem that much more dangerous for them to see the DNS queries as well. Um, so yeah, so I, if I had to guess, I would assume that they're just routing it through Tor just like any UDP traffic, but they may also additionally run their own DNS servers or, or something like that as well. 
Okay. Uh, so so anyway, there is, there is a little bit about DNS that's tricky, but um, so so yeah. So everything in Tor browser is anonymous. Everything else isn't. Uh, DNS, it's not really clear. Is that it's not something your browser does, right? But it's part of kind of what the browser is doing for you. And so, uh, you know, the the question is: Is DNS part of this, or is it part of this? And so it, it turns out it's part of this. At least the DNS for the stuff that you asked for from Tor Browser. Yeah, yeah. So at the end, your DNS uh, lookups are, are anonymous, to the best of my knowledge, anyways. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what else? Um, there are just a few other caveats, just with Tor. Uh, it, it won't stop self-disclosure. So if you go, I mean, this is sort of obvious, but if you go log into your Facebook over Tor, now Facebook knows it's you that's logging in, right? Um, so it, it can't stop self-disclosure. Or if you buy something with your credit card or whatever, then, then they know who you are even if you're over Tor. Um, uh, your cookies are basically reset with Tor, and I think it deletes on close everything, even if they're permanent cookies. We haven't really talked about cookies yet. We'll talk about them later. Um, but there's also this notion of, could a website tell who you are as a person? Like, say you go to Google every day, and sometimes you log in. So now I know, OK, this this. IP address is associated with Google, okay? But now you show up with a completely different IP address. Can I still link that? And you haven't logged in yet, okay? Could I link that session to one of the previous sessions where you did log in, right? And so one way I can do it is I can look at the exact configuration of your browser. So for example, I might ask you, I, like through the website, a website could say, um, I want you to display this in a certain font, right? Now, if you have that font installed in your browser, then you'll be able to display it. And if you don't, you won't be able to display it. And then I may be able to through JavaScript to like figure out that you can display it and then give you an alternative font. Okay. Now, what fonts you have in your browser and what fonts I have in my browser will be slightly different, right? It depends on what websites we visited and things like that. Okay. And so there's a lot. It turns out there's a lot of information in the browser that's sort of like that, like little things that are there for user configuration but that, that create a kind of fingerprint for your browser. So it's something that two people with two different browsers will have slightly different configurations, okay? Even the exact version number and, and things like that, that you can start to tell users apart, okay? So there's this notion of fingerprinting someone's browser. So a nice thing that Tor does is everyone uses the same browser. So it always looks the same way. It has the same fonts. It, it's Firefox, it's the same version of Firefox, et cetera, et cetera. So you are anonymous within all the other people that are using Tor browser. Um, so those are called super cookies, I think. I, I forget what they're called. Uh, but it's sometimes called browser fingerprinting. So it does help with that by having everyone use. Now, not everyone might not be using the latest version or things like that. Um, but but it, it helps build an anonymity set, so you're not like unique. And the the key thing too is you're using a different browser. So before, when you were logging in, you were using Safari or whatever, but now you're using Tor browser. And so yeah. 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 No, so, so we'll start the same. So we'll have the same starting point, so our browser will look the same. But then you're going to go to one website that asks you to install some font. Like, it doesn't literally ask you. It just does it. Like, it happens in the background, right? So now you have a font, but because I didn't visit that website, I don't have that font. Now our browsers look different. So everyone's browser looks the same when you install it for the first time, and then they start to diverge just by using the web. Kind of thing, yeah. So what Tor browser does is it kind of it always gives you a fresh browser, like it gives you like as if it's a freshly installed browser. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
Okay, and privacy mode two kind of does that as well. So that's another use of privacy mode in a normal browser is it kind of, it resets all your cookies and it resets uh, all your fonts and things like that. So it makes you look like, it's like as if you installed the browser for the very first time and you haven't accumulated stuff uh, by browsing. Okay, and then client-side scripting we mentioned already. Okay, so anyways, that's, that's just sort of a feel for what you're going to do for your cognitive walkthrough. So you're going to do it for these other tools. You're going to go through, you're going to think about what your core tasks are, and then you're going to think about, is it doing good on G1 to 8? Is it doing bad? Is it sort of like it's doing okay, but it could be better? Any suggestions like that? For every step, you don't have to say something about all eight guidelines, right? You don't have to say, oh, it's good on G1, it's bad on G2. Like, you don't have to go through all. You can just bring them in as they're relevant, right? So if, if you're looking at something and G7 is the relevant one, you, you bring up G7, but you don't have to bring it up in other contexts where it's not relevant to it, okay? If you want to see what it looks like more formally, you can look at the paper. You don't have to read it, like, start to finish, but you can sort of jump in the middle of the paper and just look at the kind of body, and you'll see, like, how it kind of goes through what the user's doing and then how it, you know, this raises questions about G7 and this raises questions about G4 or things like that. Okay? All right, good. Uh, so try and take a look at it and uh, next class if you have more questions about it, uh, you can ask.